Hello, and welcome to Mind with Coin Fund. I'm David Pakman, and I'm head of venture investments and managing partner at Coin Fund. And I'm Jake Brookman, founder of Coin Fund. Welcome back to Mind Coin Fund's podcast, where we get to the heart of big questions, keeping blockchain builders and founders up at night. As a reminder, we have a pretty straightforward format that captures the narratives just below the surface. We jump right in. We spent 30 to 40 minutes with crypto leaders answering the question, what should more people be talking about right now? What's that kernel of truth that keeps you up at night that you wish more people paid attention to or the thing that makes you so excited about the technology that everyone else has missed? As champions of the leaders of the new internet, CoinFund is uniquely positioned to give a platform to these non-consensus contrarian ideas. We're one of the oldest crypto-native investing firms. We've been around since 2015. We've invested in more than 100 portfolio companies across six different investing vehicles. You can learn more about us at coinfund.io. Today, we welcome Marvin Amori, most recently the chief legal officer of Uniswap Labs, to the mic for Mind. Marvin and I have had a, a really great relationship and intersected in a bunch of different eras of the web. Back in Web 2.0 life, he led the Amori Group which was a firm representing companies like Google, Apple, Dropbox, Tumblr, Twitter on the biggest policy threats to companies like that. He's often correctly called the OG net neutrality advocate. In fact, that's how we first spent time together. I was fortunate enough to go to the White House with him as he led and successfully got the Obama administration to support net neutrality. He was the First Amendment guru on that Silicon Valley TV show as an advisor. He's testified, of course, before many government bodies globally fighting for internet freedom. Marvin, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with you guys. So Marvin, it's a timely week to have you on. Before we get into current events, can you say a few words about Uniswap and Uniswap Labs and the role you played towards that mission? So Uniswap Labs is a software development company that is the primary software developer behind the Uniswap protocol, which is the leading decentralized exchange protocol to help people trade one token into another while still maintaining self-custody or determining your custodian. So if you've used a self-custody wallet like the Uniswap wallet or MetaMask or Coinbase, a lot of those trades happen through protocols like the Uniswap protocol. I was lucky enough to be the seventh employee. So I've been there uh, almost four years. I'd met Hayden. I was really impressed with his vision and what they were doing. And I, I jumped aboard, uh, leaving uh, another great uh, company in the space, Protocol Labs, which is behind IPFS and, and uh, Filecoin. I've been a crypto uh, head lawyer for different companies now for uh, seven years. So in your world, from your perspective, what are we missing? What are crypto people just not talking enough about? Well, one thing that I think we're missing is just how bipartisan crypto should be. And to be clear, you know, at the moment, it feels as though the Republican Party is really embracing the pro-crypto narrative. We see J.D. Vance chosen as the vice president. He's very pro-crypto. Uh, Ex-President Trump has been making pro-crypto promises. And we have a lot of folks such as you know, Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen endorsing President Trump, partly because of his pro-crypto views. And you know, from my point of view, this is a missed opportunity for those on the left, including progressives. I think progressives, as well as moderate Democrats, should all be pro-crypto. And that is something that I think we should talk about a bit more. And how do we persuade them to see the light? How did this rift happen? Why is it that you know, one side of the aisle is pro-crypto and another side of the aisle is anti-crypto. You know, this is something I was watching very carefully when the Biden administration began. And I think there are a lot of different reasons for it. And I think most of them are bad reasons, but, but I'll tell you a few of them. I think that one, sometimes agency heads need to feel like they, they need a target. They need quick wins or need to win. And I feel as though Gary Gensler came in and to the SEC as chairman and said, hey, I'm going to take out all the SPACs. And you know, for better or worse, the SPACs turned out to be worse, actually not better. And he was actually pretty effective in changing some accounting rules and, and taking, out, taking out the entire SPAC market pretty, pretty effectively or much of it. And I think he thought that crypto was similar. I think in his mind, there was, it was rife with scams or all these problems. And he was just going to be a small industry, get lots of headlines, and he'd be able to, to kind of shut it down. 
And that's not at all what happened. And when when you have sort of the leader of an agency for a party picking on an industry to be one of his main fights, a lot of times other party members will rally around him. And he's very effective, he's a very effective person. He was able to persuade a lot of people that they should support his views. And I don't think I don't think it was just Chair Gensler. I think there were already seeds within the progressive community that anti-crypto narratives spoke to. So if you ask people back then, why are you anti-crypto? One of the common arguments I would hear is we as a society did not regulate tech quickly enough. And tech has gotten too powerful. Right? There was a there was a lot of animosity towards Facebook, the 2016 election, blaming the 2016 election and Donald Trump on Facebook from, from progressives and Democrats. And I think they thought, hey, this is our chance to get it right in its infancy. We didn't regulate inter- the internet en- enough, and now you have big tech. Let's try to strangle uh, crypto in its cradle. And I, I think you know a lot of times people are fighting the last war. And I think the last war they were trying to fight was, was the war that they lost against big tech. And I think they obviously thought about it entirely wrong. I think of crypto as promoting little tech, promoting you know competition to big tech. But I think those were there were there were a series of narratives. But I do think the idea that crypto was just big tech and kind of finance made it a good target for them and a target they thought they could beat. Didn't have the political clout of the banks. Didn't have the power of Facebook or Google. And they thought, hey, let, let's try to get these guys before they become too powerful. There's a lot of hypocrisy in in politics, no matter what party you're looking at. It, it seems like you cannot separate hypocrisy from politics. But just from a pure policy perspective, if you just take the politics out of it, it feels like I know we established inconvenient and the wrong narratives around crypto for like almost a decade. But anyone who actually spends a little bit of time on it finds that there's tons of components of it that are like totally aligned with progressive values. I mean, the Democrats were never the most friendliest with big banks, right? Like that certainly wasn't a a main plank of the party. And and it's obvious that like the very first, one of the very first use cases for crypto are, you know, is independent financial systems and lower fees on different rails. So Marvin, like if you just take the the politics people out of it, weren't there policy people somewhere in the progressive uh, wing of the party saying like, hey, wait a second, there's some really interesting themes here that we should be for. That is a very interesting question. So implicit in your question is, hey, why are the banks and the and the most progressive Democrats, who usually are the bank's opponents, totally aligned on this issue? Why are Jamie Dimon and Elizabeth Warren reading from the same, same talking points when it comes to cryptocurrency? That's that's really surprising. And it it's partly the politics, but when you divide politics and policy, Bank lobbyists are really smart. They know which policy arguments to make. They don't go in there and say, hey, you should vote our way because we give a lot of money to to super PACs. They say, everyone knows that we have political power, but let's explain to you why it should matter to you in your own language, Elizabeth Warren, to be anti-crypto. And so one of the things you you might hear Elizabeth Warren say is at least the banks are regulated. You You heard them say that, right? This notion that hey, we Democrats care about regulation and the banks are regulated. They're regulated when it comes to AML, right? There's overblown AML concerns. That's one example. They're regulated when it comes to you know, safety and soundness, right? So the, the bank lobbyists are very effective, right? They know which arguments to make. And I remember in the early days, I would hear uh, progressives say, oh, well, I believe in the state. That's why I'm anti-crypto. And so there was this notion that, hey, all of crypto is libertarian. They don't believe in working with the state the same way, let's say, uh, banks do. And and so if your worldview is regulation is good, right? then there are lots of arguments for why the banks can convince you to to side with them. Another part of their historical worldview is that, quote, shadow banks are bad or unregulated financial institutions are bad. And if you look back to the financial collapse, in their mind, the narrative they have is, this is you know, shadow banking outside of regulation. There's all this risk in the system. And I think their narrative was completely wrong, but it was that kind of pattern matching that I think the very effective 
bank lobbyists who are, again, you know, lobbying against crypto, right? They're the ones who are lobbying against crypto. Is that a generational thing, Marvin? Is that just like not understanding the technology that, you know, crypto is bringing to the table? If we think of some of the issues that are very progressive and just American, right? One, blockchain technology permits self-custody, right? Money is a technology that's essentially spreadsheets being kept up to date by banks, right? It's not dollar bills or coins, it's spreadsheets. It's the magic of bank reconciliation. No one understands keeping every spreadsheet accurate when I move money to you, right? We all know that our money is not gonna disappear. What blockchain technology does is it's a new kind of spreadsheet that can stay up to date without banks. And so you don't need to hand your money to a bank for them to keep track of your money. You can actually just natively on the internet, your Bitcoin, Ethereum, you name it, custody your assets without relying on a bank or any other custodian. That is a pretty magical thing, right? You can choose your own custodian. That would, prom- that would provide competition to the banks, right? If you could choose lots of different kinds of custodians, different kinds of trusts, et cetera. It also would permit people in war torn areas, people who can't get bank accounts, to have access to electronic assets, to be able to maintain and store those assets. You also have something that progressives and all Americans should care about, which is lower payment fees, right? Not only can you self custody, you can move money extremely cheaply, right? Fractions of a penny. Right? One of the biggest expenses for a lot of small businesses are credit card fees, two or three percent or whatever that amount is. If you if you could reduce that, you know that's like half of inflation in a bad year, right? So cheap fees, self custody. Those two are are, are radical um, improvements to the financial system and very progressive. If you go down the line, if you have self custody, if you have low payments, you can set up things like decentralized finance where you can borrow and lend against your own assets, whatever color you are, right? Without any what, you know, without, the, without any uh, racism or any issue like that. So you see a lot of that when it comes to lending markets like Compound, just lend, borrowing against digital assets. And then uh, I can go on and on about how amazingly awesome Uniswap protocol is. But the Uniswap protocol is really awesome in terms of creating markets in a new and novel way that was not possible before uh, blockchain, right? There are automated market makers, uh, which provide deep and automatic liquidity 24-7, for long tail and short tail in a way that we have not had in traditional markets. In traditional markets, you have um, very sophisticated companies like Citadel and Virtue making markets in very in, in a few very liquid assets like Apple and major stocks like that. And high frequency trading firms, it's very expensive and they can't make markets for the long tail of all assets out there because it's expensive to do the hedging and all, all that stuff. It's very impressive what they do. but Uniswap protocol permits automated market making and a price for every kind of asset. Right? That's why you can have thousands of assets trading on the protocol and you can have uh, people who self-custody their assets, determining the balance of assets that they want without having to ever hand them over to anyone, not to Coinbase, not to Bank of America, not to JP Morgan, and inexpensively, right? So having deep liquid markets across lots of assets and a price for everything is a major advance in financial technology and is beneficial to everyone. So I think we could make a very long list. You've offered at least five or six of sort of core innovations that are part of crypto and, and blockchain that should be aligned with progressive values. But you know, the past is past and we didn't make those arguments at the right time to the right people, but there's nothing like politics to help change politicians' minds. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, I mean, say what you will about Donald Trump and the previous Trump administration, But like, he's a really good politician. My distance read is that he sensed that there's, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pro-crypto people in the United States who would be absolutely excited by a pro-crypto platform and all of a sudden started talking about it. And immediately it became even more partisan than than it probably should be. But boy, that, that woke a lot of people up. And combine that with what we know about some of the PACs that have been applying pressure to anti-crypto candidates and supporting pro-crypto candidates. So Marvin, can you maybe through this lens of now shifting from policy to politics, how has the ground changed? I I think you summarized it very well. I mean, the ground shifted dramatically when Donald Trump came out aggressively in favor of crypto. Now, as you mentioned, his previous administration was not pro-crypto. And you remember our net neutrality fights. Barack Obama made 
awesome campaign promises about net neutrality, and we still had to force him to, to keep those promises through a lot of hard work. So whether or not Donald Trump wins, the crypto community is going to have to do a lot of work in DC to make sure that Donald Trump keeps those promises. That said, uh, you know, nothing wakes up a politician's interest more than like 50 million people doing something and 50 million people in America own crypto. I don't think they realize that. I don't think the Democrats realize that a lot of those people were Democrats. A lot of them were people who traditionally vote Democratic. And so you combine millions of people whose savings are in an asset, right? I think the $150 million super PAC called Fair Shake targeting different Senate and House races. And all of a sudden, the politicians have to pay attention. Right? Like, and you know, on the long list of to-dos, they didn't realize crypto was one of them until it was forced upon them. So what I think this has permitted people to do is, you know, there was never a huge constituency that was anti-crypto, right? The people who were like anti-crypto were a small, small group of people in just a few agencies and in, in a few groups, right? It was, it was not widespread. It didn't even spread to moderate Democrats or even to a lot of progressives. It was Elizabeth Warren, but not Bernie Sanders. He's never talked about crypto. So it was a really small, insular group. And I think a lot of those people were worried about, I think a lot of other Democrats were worried about being criticized. They didn't want to be criticized by Elizabeth Warren, didn't want to be called out, didn't want to challenge their own party. And now that there are these countervailing wins, I think moderates and even other progressives can say, hey, why are we doing this? Why are we letting some agenda that no one cared all that much about, that Biden probably doesn't know anything about, potentially hurt the presidential chances, cost us the Senate. Why on earth are we doing this? And the topic, I think, of financial regulation had been delegated to Elizabeth Warren. And I think I think this one issue was just mismanaged and in a way that's been blowing up at them. And I, and I you don't see Elizabeth Warren quite as vocal as she used to be, probably because others in her party must be realizing, hey, we really should probably moderate on this a bit. Marvin, do you think crypto is an issue that can actually swing the election? Like, are there enough crypto people for whom, you know, this is a single issue vote, or at least that this is a, this is an issue that's so important to them that, that they'll vote like along those lines. You know, it's really hard to predict elections, especially the presidential. Some people will tell you, Hey, crypto is going to have no impact at all on the presidential. Even a $150 million super PAC is nothing compared to the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of these two candidates, plus the billions of dollars they're spending. Plus, you know, it's unclear how, how close any of these swing states will be. So that's, that's one side of it. The other side of it is, um, you know, we know that they're going to have an impact in the Senate, right? The fair shake has already had an impact on the Senate, right? And in the California race with Adam Schiff versus Katie Porter, Every, everyone looks at that as a real impact by fair shake, and we expect them to have an impact across other Senate races. And if the race is going to be close, and the last election was super close, and a lot of our elections the last 20 years have been super close, where even the party that you know wins the Electoral College might not even have the, the majority of the votes for the country for the popular vote. If it's going to be close, almost every issue could be the, determin the determining factor. And there are a lot of young folks who uh, who see this as a generational issue. There are a lot of people who are just into tech who see what the policies were around crypto. And I don't think that, the you know, I, I think the Democrats' folly on crypto didn't just, you know, push away crypto advocates. I think it pushed away big te tech in general, big tech, small tech, just tech, right? If you're... Um, you know, I'll give you an example. I'll quote Mark Cuban. I think I'm allowed to do this. There was a meeting last week with with some folks in the administration. It was reported. Uh, Ro Khanna organized it, a congressman from Silicon Valley. And Mark Cuban showed up. It was, it was great. Mark Cuban had been saying that he thought crypto would cost Biden the election. And he got kind of radicalized on the issue because out of all of his thousands of investments or whatever, he had one called Lazy.com that lets you show NFTs. And they went to the to the SEC and they said, hey, is, is this legit? Can we do it? And they didn't get an answer at all. And they were told to go spend thousands of dollars on lawyers. And I think that there are probably a lot of people across Silicon Valley and in, in the New York tech scene 
who have like one of their 20 investments who are angel investors or one of their friends works at a crypto company and they hear what's going on and it, and it sours them to not just the SEC, but the whole Biden administration. So, um, and, and I think it's been, it, it's been a lot of collateral damage that they did not expect, that the Democrats did not expect from this, that could be fixed, right? I don't think, you know, the entire party is anti-tech. I don't think the entire party is uh, a tenth as unreasonable as the SEC was when it came to some things, right? The SEC was essentially lawless, right? The SEC was acting so far beyond the, the way that administrative agencies should work. They'd say, come in and register, then they wouldn't register anyone, right? They'd sue you instead. They would provide no path. They were taking, you know, they, they did things like, you know, lie to a judge in Utah on the debt box case, right? They've changed their theories of, of the case in every single court case over and over. It's not reasoned administrative rulemaking, right? And so it's enough to make most people pretty disillusioned if they don't think of it as just one agency's problem, right? And so for a lot of tech people, they say, oh, well, this feels like the Democrats as a whole. And I don't think that's true, but the damage has been far broader than they expected. So you're pointing out that the thing that not everyone's talking about is that crypto can and should be bipartisan. We've spent much time talking about our kind of disbelief that that the progressives didn't spend time thinking about the fact that this there's a bunch of pro-progressive ethos to what crypto people build. We've talked about the fact that, well, I, I still don't understand, like th this could easily be just taken off the table right now, right? Like like Biden and Harris and, you know, could stand up and be like, we're pro-crypto. Th this is silly. We, we really don't care about this at all. So it's easy for us to be pro-crypto. So, you know, SEC, knock it off. And we're going to, we're going to push for legislation, but I mean, there's so many things they could do. They're still not doing that. So, but let's give a fair reading to what the Republicans are doing, what, what Trump and now JD Vance are saying, just because it's, it's fair for us to do so. So tell us a little bit, Marvin, about what you're, and, and I agree with your preface, like we can't trust anything any politician says during a campaign, but still what arguments are, uh, are the, is the Trump campaign making about why crypto is important? The Trump campaign has been pretty vague, but they've essentially said they're pro-crypto and that they will end the Biden war against crypto. And that's probably enough for anyone to hear, right? Like the, the, the Biden administration should have regulated crypto, right? That's what Democrats do. They know how to regulate markets, but they have this idea that maybe they could ban it or, or, or make it go away or push it abroad, but simply ending the war and bringing crypto under a regulatory umbrella is enough to make most people in crypto really, really happy at this point. So the reason why I say you can't trust any, any politician's promises isn't because politicians are, are liars or they mean to be liars. It's because DC doesn't change, right? But, uh, you know, to use President Trump's language, the swamp is still there, right? And so when we worked together, David, and President Obama as a candidate said he would take a backseat to no one when it came to net neutrality, he showed up, he appointed a bunch of people, and they realized, oh my God, the telecom lobbyists and the cable lobbyists are still here, and they're still popular, and they're still, not popular, they're still powerful, right? They still lobby lots of folks in Congress. They still were able to get into the agencies and give people a, a false narrative that we'd have to, so we had to do all this work to convince enough other senators that could go on our side and do the work with the administration to use political capital on the topic. And I think what will happen, even under a Trump administration, is that there will be opponents to crypto, as there were in the last Trump administration. And the people who don't disappear are like the banks. Right? Jamie Dimon has said over and over that he thinks crypto should be banned, right? Uh, he says that publicly. I hear he says that privately. And uh, he's a very impressive opponent to have, right? And so those people aren't going away. And so even if President Trump gets elected, the crypto community needs to, I guess this is something that's very contrarian when it comes to crypto. The crypto community will need to invest a lot more in DC. Blockchain Association is massively underfunded for the challenge of fighting some of the biggest banks in the world on some topics, right? Massively underfunded is also the DeFi Education Fund. I don't know if you guys remember, there's a little bit of controversy when they proposed uh, to the Uniswap governance, you know, I think it was less than $20 million. Right. If I had been um, advocating out there for it aggressively, 
I'd have said we need $100 million over the next few years, right? Uh, lawyers are expensive. Lobbyists are expensive. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat out there. You also need press. You need a whole bunch of different tools. We, we now have the super PAC as a tool. We don't have what people call hard money as a tool. We don't have enough lobbyists. If we're going to be successful in the long haul, there's going to have to be a bigger investment. And I and you and I saw this, David, when Google and you know Facebook went from like having one guy in DC to having like three people in DC to having you know 50 and and then hundreds of of lobbying. Uh, I, I say folks at lobbying firms and PR firms uh, globally, and that that's what unfortunately industries need because. Um, incumbents will use regulatory processes against new entrants. One of the other recent news items has been that uh, J.D. Vance has been selected by uh, former President Trump as his running mate. Um, and I think this has been seen as quite bullish within crypto just on the fact that, for example, uh, Mr. Vance holds Bitcoin. And I was just wondering if, um, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Um, running mate kind of nomination and, and how this might impact things going forward. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my first three thoughts about the JD Vance pick have nothing to do with crypto. It's one, <laughs> this, this guy called Trump Hitler and now is his running mate uh, and seemed to be really worried about the future of democracy. Uh, two, um, he, He's very pro-Russia and very you know, anti-Ukraine from what I can tell. And that's, that's really problematic, I think, in the global balance of things. So um, I guess those are the two things that come to mind, which lead to the third point, which is I just saw Vitalik Buterin had tweeted that he doesn't pick his candidates based on their pro-crypto sympathies. And from my point of view, kinds of governments that sustain long-term investment, growth, business, are those that have rule of law, certainty, tend to be democracies, right? Where you don't have to give a percentage of your company to a particular family, right? So uh, that, that's running things. So my views on the JD Vance pick are that it seems to double down on um, you know someone who has said he would have certified the election and the big lie that Trump actually won or that those electors were, were, were contested when they weren't, right? Everyone knows Trump lost the election. Mike Pence knows. Um, and I guess my first thought was, hey, why didn't he just run with the same guy he ran with last time? Right, but we all know Mike Pence. I can't run with Trump because um, people wanted to hang him for it. So anyway, those are my first views. Um, JD Vance is very pro crypto, uh, very pro tech, and I think that his pick has been helpful to getting much of the tech industry more excited about the Trump uh, uh, candidacy. What, one thing to, to remember: I don't know if you guys remember the the Larry David Curb Enthusiasm episode where he would wear a MAGA hat in order to keep people from talking to him. People were so horrified that he was wearing a MAGA hat that they wouldn't sit next to him at restaurants. They wouldn't, they wouldn't sit, they wouldn't, they'd leave lunch if they had lunch planned with him. That has changed dramatically, right? Being a Trump supporter is no longer some sort of scarlet letter or some sort of embarrassing thing, right? It's very touted by people in Silicon Valley uh, in a way that it would not have been even, you know, even last year, two years ago. So I think, I think, as David said, Donald Trump is a very exceptionally talented politician. Uh, and and I think the fans pick was very helpful from a tech point of view. Marvin, like when I think back about why tech had running room in in the 90s and 2000s, I think it was because not a lot of people understood what industries it could threaten. You know, the telecoms were making a lot of money from, still are, from attaching people to the internet. Uh, it's like the best part of their business, actually, right? Um, you know, you had a couple media companies like Viacom try to, you know, sue YouTube and sue the whole internet. Um, but but for the most part, you know, it was sort of a slow challenger to industries. You know, newspapers first, um, but they survived just, you know, not all of them. We, we lost thousands of independent ones. Um, but it was really a shift in distribution. It wasn't like this major knife that destroyed so many industries, you know, travel agents a little bit. So as a result, like the lobbyists weren't as lined up in the 90s and the 2000s to like turn off the internet. Um, and and also I think because of that, tech was able to be slow and non, not, not very, you know, it, we went 15 years before any major tech company had like some meaningful lobbyists in DC. Microsoft was probably the first to really invest there because it was the, you know, the first 
antitrust lawsuit where it's like, whoa, a second, we're getting we're getting killed here. But now, yes, we have all the big tech companies with massive lobbyists, uh, lobby presence in, in D.C. And tech is is no longer an underdog. I mean, it is like the king of so many industries. But a few haven't really changed much, and that's financial services and the way money moves and, and money itself. And those are really, really well-funded industries on the lobby side and on the policy side, because as you point out, they're, they're, are, they're already regulated. So aside from like a pro-crypto or, or crypto-tolerant White House and, and a changing of the political landscape, what are the catalysts that will help push policymakers and banks to be more crypto over time? I mean, if if it's just spending, which you know doesn't feel like it is, but but if it's like okay, crypto people, the only way you're going to mainstream this in the U.S. at least is to equal the banks' lobbying efforts. Well, like that's a pretty tall order. Um, but what are some other catalysts that could help policymakers and banks say, wait a second, this is not just a threat; it's an opportunity, and maybe we should embrace. It's exactly the history you're talking about, David. Right? So you see, you used to see a lot of incumbents fighting technologies that actually ended up making them more money. So Hollywood tried to sue the VCR out of existence in the 80s, and then they ended up making a lot of money through you know, VCR sales and rentals uh, and a kind of windowing strategy of how they distributed films. Um, AT&T uh, tried to kill uh, and, or did not release cell phones and, and mobile phones because they were worried people would, would leave their landline. Well, now they can sell a mobile phone to three different people in a home instead of just one landline to each home. So they ended up making even more money. And I think that when it came to the internet, there were fights actually kind of all throughout. The copyright industry sued and sued and sued uh, even before YouTube Viacom. Uh, and they had already crafted the laws in their favor where like every single copyright infringement was a $250,000 fine, to be massive over the top fine. So they could use that tool that they lobbied for to then sue tech companies and shake them down. So, um, so, so that fight was always ongoing. I think when it comes to the banks, I think the banks will be better off. I think a lot of finance institutions will be better off with blockchain technology. And the thing about finances, and I've been, you know, I've been kind of, talking about how the banks are, are against crypto, a lot of the non-banks, like asset managers like BlackRock, have already embraced uh, crypto. And within every big bank, even JP Morgan, there are parts of that bank that want to embrace crypto, like the, the wealth management portion, right? They want to be able to invest in crypto. Um, and so while um, you know some parts of the crypto industry could challenge some parts of the financial industry, right? The finance industry is not going away, right? Centralized banking, as it exists, is not going away. And so I think what will happen is eventually there will be enough different ways for them to make money off the technology and be partners in the technology that you know, it will seem in retrospect uh, as simply a negotiation tactic to, uh, to have lobbied so aggressively against the industry. Maybe, maybe that's a good segue um, you know, to ask you about Uniswap. You spent a significant uh, amount of your time working on Uniswap and Uniswap Labs. How is Uniswap an example of this sort of convergence between the traditional world and you know, DeFi and blockchain technology? And what are some of the, I guess, value propositions and innovation that Uniswap is bringing to that equation? So you know, at a basic level, Uniswap, and we'll just stick to the Ethereum blockchain, let's say anyone exchange one ERC-20 token for another. For those who don't know, an ERC-20 token is a, it's a standard for creating tokens on Ethereum. So you can create any kind of digital value with an ERC-20. Same way you can create any kind of photo with a JPEG or any kind of document with a PDF. An ERC-20 is a file format. We let people exchange one ERC-20 for another. So that ERC-20 could represent a stable coin, right? So if you wanted to exchange a stable coin, which is uh, essentially a it's fixed to a dollar, like a USDC or USDT, and you live abroad and you have Bitcoin, you know, have wrapped Bitcoin or Ethereum, and you want stable coins, you can get into stable coins, right? You can essentially access any kind of asset, stable coins, digital gold, if that's what you think Bitcoin is, um, layer one tokens, could be securities in the future, could be derivatives, could be a meme that you love, MAGA or Geo Biden, right? It is a file format that, can represent any kind of value. 
And Uniswap lets you trade one for the other in a common infrastructure. Traditional markets now, there are different kinds of infrastructure markets for derivatives and for for stocks and for for you know all these um, foreign stocks. You could have one shared technological infrastructure of a permissionless protocol that everyone can access, everyone can integrate. The possibilities of what it can do if it were integrated more broadly into the economy are somewhat limitless, right? It's almost like when when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, he didn't say, oh, in a few years, we'll be able to call a black car with this thing. No one even predicted it. He said it was a web, it was a web engine, a phone, and, uh, and an iPod, right? So it's hard to predict what can happen from a general purpose technology that lets you transfer any kind of value into another kind of value. Um, so in terms of the markets, it could threaten, threaten or augment, right? As I said, the the way markets are usually made is through a through a high frequency trading firm, right? So when people talk about market making, if I want to sell 21 shares of Apple, the odds that somebody else on the planet wants to buy 21 shares of Apple at the same moment, fairly low. So these firms spring up and they buy 21 shares of Apple and they have some inventory and they sell it. And they're always intermediating between uh, two different people, buyers and sellers. And it's a very sophisticated, hard business, somewhat expensive. You need you know, quants and mathematicians. Now, those people will still trade on Uniswap, right? They will find ways to make market on the Uniswap protocol in terms of concentrated liquidity and moving liquidity in and out. And they're going to do it in a very smart, sophisticated way because they have a bunch of skills that they're very good at that will be profitable in any kind of market. But you could also have non-experts providing liquidity to the, the Pac-Man Amori pool, right? If you have some Pac-Man coin and some Amori coin, you can put them in one pool and people can buy and sell against them. And you're crowdfunding liquidity into that pool, the same way people are essentially crowdfunding entertainment into, it's into YouTube. It's kind of like YouTube for markets. And there'd be thousands of tokens with 24 seven liquidity without relying on high frequency traders intermediating every trade. And that can be revolutionary because there are a lot of assets that are illiquid. If you have to sell the asset uh, quickly, you might have to take it at a steep discount. There might not be enough people willing to, to buy and sell. Those are what people call illiquid assets. You can make more and more assets liquid, right? You could in theory make real estate liquid. And at the moment, um, you know, partly because the regulatory system has not embraced crypto and blockchain technologies, a lot of that is still maybe years away. But it's it's not the technology that's holding us back. It's the regulation that's holding us back, right? You could find ways to put stocks on Uniswap and have them trade efficiently and effectively, perhaps more efficiently and effectively than under traditional markets where a lot of a lot of long tail stocks are liquid. A lot of long tail debt is a liquid. A lot of debt is sold through phone calls, right? You could you could dramatically change and upgrade the financial system through the Uniswap protocol, but the thing standing in the way is that policymakers are not on board with it yet. Pretty amazing company, though. Like I think you're sort of under promoting what Uniswap accomplished in a short amount of time with with a very small number of people. Can you just remind like- Oh yeah, sure, how many sure. People- I'm, I'm talking too much about the future versus uh, versus the company itself. If it does transform all the financial markets, uh, I don't think I'm underselling it there, but what, what the Uniswap Labs team did with you know about a hundred people now and much less than that before was uh, essentially create, creating the first successful automated market maker. This had been theorized for for a long time. Uh, there have been a lot of scholarship and thinking about how do we create an, a market maker that's automa- automatic and doesn't rely on high frequency traders to be intermediating every trade. And even folks in crypto tried it, but the first one that was successful was, was the Uniswap protocol. And when it was uh, launched by Hayden Adams, he was just one guy. He had a $100,000 grant. He hadn't raised hundreds of millions or tens of millions in an ICO, like a lot of the competing decentralized trading protocols. It was just him and he put it out and it was such a great idea, so so effective that it took off, right? And then he was able to raise funding from, from Paradigm and uh, Andreessen and a bunch of other investors and then build a team around it. And now we have, you know, a fourth version of the protocol has been announced. We have three versions of the protocol. It is the dominant trading protocol in crypto. 
It's been trillions of dollars in volume over the lifetime of the protocol. And it's sort of, it's integrated with almost every uh, self-custody wallet that lets you trade Ethereum. It's been deployed to multiple different blockchains. So uh, it's a very, very small team. And on a day-to-day -day basis, there's, you know, over you know, one to $2 billion in, in volume traded. And the reason why that's possible for a hundred people to permit this kind of volume, and this kind of usage is it's permissionless. No one has to trust us or know who we are at all. Right? They just have to trust the code. Anyone can integrate it. So it can be integrated in MetaMask, Coinbase. We can't change the rules. Unlike when Twitter had an API that every third party used, then they change. We can't change the rules. Everyone can integrate it, and we can never stop them from integrating it. Uh, and uh, it's all transparent. So that kind of transparency and permissionlessness, uh, combined with um, the fact that it gives you great price and liquidity across lots of assets, means that people will use it not because Hayden has a fancy degree. You know, he doesn't really. Not because like. I wear a nice suit and uh, come from a fancy background at a bank or something, I don't. Um, but just because the thing is awesome. Uh, and that's something you could have in crypto and in blockchains that you don't have tr in traditional finance. Right? I don't think Hayden could have gotten a job on Wall Street. And now here he is revolutionizing it. Awesome. Thank you, Marvin. I think that brings us to the end of our program here today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been excellent to have you on the show. Uh, we've been chatting with Uniswap Labs' most recent Chief Legal Officer, Marvin Amori. David and I could probably do this for hours, so let's keep the conversation going in the comments. Leave us a review. Let us know what you thought. And now, our shameless Twitter plugs. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my handle is jbrook, spelled J-B-R-U-K-H. David's handle is at Pacman, spelled P-A-K-M-A-N. Marvin, what's your handle? At Amori, A-M-M-O-R-I. There you go. And also follow CoinFund, CoinFund underscore IO. Please make sure that you subscribe where you get your podcasts and we'll be back soon to dig deep on ideas that are worth fighting for. Thank you. Mm -hmm.